name is Richard Green. I'm director of the USC Lusk Center for Real Estate and welcome back to Lusk Perspectives. This is, I believe, our 21st installment um, of a series that we started uh, on March 22nd as we all needed entertainment as we remain at home. And it is my very distinct pleasure to welcome today a, a good friend of the Lusk Center, Colin Barrow. Uh, Colin has had three distinguished careers. He uh, very successful in private equity, uh, very successful in politics. He was leader of Westminster, um, which is the part of London that you have likely visited if you have ever been to London. Um, and leader is equivalent to a mayor uh, of an American city. And since then, an academic with positions both at Stanford and here at USC. Uh, we have had Colin speak to our students. He, we've had him speak to our board. Um, he always is thought provoking and crowd pleasing at the same time. Uh, I hear people, Colin, quote you uh, months after they hear you, uh, which is the sign of someone who says things that stick. And so uh, again, I'd like you to welcome you back and uh, let me ask you to take it away. All right, thank you. Um, well, you've, uh, you've asked me to speak about what's going on in the European Union, uh, or rather in Europe. Um, I, as a Brit, I should probably put it that way. Um, and I wanted to start by um, citing two experiences. Uh, they've just, I, I'm speaking to you now from Switzerland, which is where I primarily live. I also have a home in London. But about two weeks ago, they opened the border to Italy. So we got in the car and drove to Venice, um, which was memorably empty, but functioning in every respect. Um, the famous Venetian arrogance uh, was absent, though. All the uh, restaurateurs were prostrating themselves in front of our feet as the few tourists uh, around saying, please come into our place, it'll be wonderful, we'll feed you well, it'll be all be great. Nobody was wearing a mask except in shops um, uh, and on public transport. But uh, other than that, everything was kind of normal. The second experience um, was, uh, well, the subset of that was in Milan where it was quite different, everybody was very frightened, everybody was wearing masks everywhere. Um, and not going out quite as much as they used to, um, but uh, shopping nonetheless. In next week, we're going to London. And I tried to fix up with a friend of mine whether we should, and Anna's been trying to do the same thing, trying to fix up a friend of mine to go out for dinner. And people say, well, you know, it's kind of early days now. I'm not sure about public transport. I'm not sure about, you know, whether we'll be able to achieve the distancing and so on and so forth. So, the fierceness of the reaction in two countries that have done it very fiercely, Italy was locked down very firmly, and so was Britain. Um, when you come out of lockdown, as we're now beginning to do, people are very jumpy. Uh, Italy is three weeks ahead of us, uh, ahead of Britain, that is, and um, Britain is only just emerging uh, into the light uh, now. So the process, last time I gave this, uh, and went on to this conversation, I spoke a little bit about, uh, about everybody being locked down. Now, now it's a question of everybody coming out and what the consequences of that are. People are coming out um, in different countries at different times, but I can tell you Switzerland was one of the first, and now everything is pretty much, pretty much back to normal. I've just out, been out for a walk, and there's a bunch of kids on a basketball court not observing any social distancing, not wearing masks, not doing anything uh, out of the ordinary at all. You wouldn't know you'd had coronavirus. Yeah. Um, and these, these um, activities are there, um, despite the fact that um, quite a lot of people have died. Um, quite a, everybody knows somebody who's had it. Everybody knows somebody who's died from it. And it's been a pretty serious event um, over here. And a lot of people are impacted by uh, the economic effects. I think one of the things I'd like to say is that I think the economic effects are somewhat, or will turn out to be, somewhat exaggerated. I'll explain why. If you imagine if you um, have a, a, a private business, um, you have a landlord, a bank, um, you have customers, and you have staff, it is quite possible that you will have done a deal with your landlord to defer, roll up, maintain your cash flow, maybe even forgive 
the rent for this uh, period. You certainly can't be evicted. Secondly, in um, your staff are now paid by the state and they're paid less than they would ordinarily be paid in most cases, but the, they absorb that and the tax effects make it bearable. So your staff have gone away as a cost. Your, uh, you might find that your um, uh, cost of your real estate has gone away. It may be that your bank has also forgiven you, albeit they'll probably have roll it, uh, rolled it up. And your turnover, of course, will have disappeared for that period at the same time. So the net economic effect on you as a business is much less than the gross reduction in GDP might imply. So I think we might find that, that quite a lot of businesses will have weathered this perfectly well, even though their operations, a bit like in the hospitality industry and the travel industry, might have been brought to a complete halt. Um, in, in, in many businesses, uh, those operations have not been brought to a complete halt at all. They have been um, uh, operating perfectly well, but with people um, in, dare I say, it, the middle and upper income bracket functioning using technology such as the one we're using now. So I suspect, um, though I hesitate to say too much about economics, I, I suspect that we're going to find that the damage to the economy uh, will not be as great as it is uh, reported to be. However, there will be one effect, which will be that quite a lot of middle to lower income people is becoming increasingly clear that will not go back to work, will we'll either return to their home country or will uh, we'll, uh, have to retrain and do something else. And that will be, uh, in some ways, uh, good news for business, although unattractive uh, that that's the reason. Uh, it means that uh, the labour supplies will get easier, uh, the cost of labour will reduce, uh, the pressures for full employment will reduce, and therefore uh, things may get better rather quicker than expected. And even the Bank of England is forecasting a V-shaped recovery um, and uh, rather than an L-shaped or U-shaped recovery, which is remarkable from an otherwise uh, conservative institution. That said, uh, 5 or 10% reduction in GDP uh, for uh, the year is what is the consensus view in most countries um, with um, considerable fiscal measures which vary very widely from country to country being put in place to cushion the impact of the economic fall but now everybody's beginning to get used to getting back to work and it seems to be going um, reasonably well although there will be probably some permanent adjustment, another permanent adjustment, which will be that all these nice middle-class people who used to get on trains and go to work every day will probably find that it's rather nicer to work from home as long as they can find something to do with the children um, who will shortly be allowed back into schools. Once that is the case, the attractions of working from home will be considerable and quite a lot, and the, the gentle trend away from working in cities towards working in the penumbra of cities will probably accelerate somewhat. Um, the aggregation effect of being in a city, being around people, being able to see people and so on and so forth will still be there, but people will possibly only practice that two or three times a week, uh, as opposed to every day rigorously on the 8.15 from here to there. So there will be uh, fundamental changes. I suspect we will travel less uh, same amount for leisure, but less for business. I think that finance directors are likely to uh, suggest that teleconferencing is a perfectly good way of communicating with people and that, that, that you can go and see your customers once a year rather than once a month. So that's the, those are the broad um, uh, trends, I think. I can go into quite a lot of it in, some, uh, in greater detail. Uh, particularly the politics of it, which is in England quite fierce. Um, and um, it's germane to a substantially American audience that uh, political leaders initially in a crisis like this um, have a certain amount of support from their electorates, uh, as crisis leaders often do. But gradually the media, especially if they adopt the um, you know, US and UK model of adversarial journalism, um, will soon pick that apart. And we've seen Boris Johnson's um, popularity go from plus 16 to minus seven or so. 
um, over the course of this epidemic when he is a relatively sympathetic figure having himself been hit quite hard with the illness. So um, it, leaders are not coming out of this well and in many countries the government systems are not going out, coming out of this well, uh, my own country included. Switzerland is operate, has done this very differently from the UK, I won't go into that with a great deal of detail, but the UK has, um, has sort of tripped up with its nationalised medicine, shown to be not a better mousetrap particularly. Um, it's, uh, it, it's got its own uh, problems, not least uh, the fact that it has prioritised COVID to the exclusion of virtually any other medical condition. So as a result, there's lots of cancer patients now turning up saying, well, I haven't had any treatment for several months, and my diagnoses have been delayed, and so on, and I haven't had any access to doctors and hospitals and so on, because they've all been too busy dealing with COVID. That has been a problem for the government, and I think that the inevitable public inquiry will show, show the government service to have been a bit lacking, um, and uh, that may be an impetus for government reform. Broad trends. So, so Colin, I, I just want to hit on that point because I think it's a really important one. Can you talk a little bit about how the Swiss health system is different from the UK health system? Because there are, I think, probably people in our audience who don't know. Yes, the, the UK health system is um, a, what is called a single payer system. It is a nationalized system. It covers about 93% of uh, the population, in fact, it covers the whole population, but, um, and everybody has the right to go into hospital, uh, get a medical care uh, free at the point of delivery. As with any such system, it doesn't take long to work out that if everybody can use it at all times without any payment, there will inevitably have to be some rationing, and that is the central control mechanism that has been used during this to prioritize COVID. In Switzerland, the system is very different. Um, the government is there as a guarantor of a minimum standard of cover, and a private insurance company is obligated, all the private insurance companies are obligated to offer to anyone who's got the right to live in Switzerland, the right to be covered at broadly the same rate <coughs> to the, that minimum standard. Now, if they want to add on private rooms, fluffy pillows, um, you know, all sorts of bells and whistles they can, but, uh, but the basic level of cover is guaranteed by the state and provided by private providers working for private insurers. And it's the extras that provide the competitive differences between the insurance cover. So the, so the system is very different, but the outcome is broadly the same. Um, the vast majority of people just have the fluffy pillows type of in, enhanced access, so everybody has broadly the same uh, same care, but the system is different, and the, therefore the degree of control by the central government is different. You were going to move on to a next topic, but I just wanted to sort of. Um... Yeah, I, I well, I wasn't going to move on to the next topic. Uh, I was going to I was going to let you move me on to the next. Ah, uh, uh, okay, uh, very good. Topic. Well, okay, so let's so let's do that. So I, I, you talk about leadership and it being difficult to avoid the pitfalls of dealing with uh, um, adversarial press. But as it happens, I was reading a story about Angela Merkel this morning where her popularity is like 82%. Yes. Right now. So what, what is different? Is just Germany different or is it that Merkel is different? It's, it, it is, I think, both. Um, uh, Germany is not the most um, uh, adversarial, nor the least adversarial um, press. But Angela Merkel is a very different kind of leader uh, from those uh, uh, first, of, first of all, she's, she is a scientist. And she, when you hear her talk about uh, this uh, disease, you hear her speaking in scientific terms. She doesn't defer to the scientist, takes advice, and she explains it in scientific terms. And she will say things like, if we do too much of that, then this will be the consequence. And it will have the R rate will go up to this, and therefore 6.4% of hospitals will be overwhelmed. And you know, she speaks in those terms. And as a result, since Germany has got some of the best results in Europe, she's got the credit for that. Um, uh, because she is supposed to be in charge, and in many ways she is. The German system is very similar, by the way, to the Swiss system. There's one major difference. 
from any other part of Europe, as far as I can tell, which is that public health in Germany is in the hands of local government. And the states um, have their own public health departments, which mean that they can jump on particular issues with the local health, the local police, the local state machinery, and so on and so forth, in a way that in England takes forever. It's got to all go up headquarters and all come back down again. And nobody, you know, it's all a government machine. It's, it's when people speak disparagingly of the federal government in the United States, that's how Britain is. And, um, and when people think about distributed systems, that's how Germany, Germany is. But Angela Merkel is, a, is coming to the end of her time. Um, and I think she's been given the benefit of, of a reasonably successful run and she's done pretty well. Germany's, Germans are pretty proud of themselves at the moment. And in many ways, right, sir. Yeah, it, it is kind of interesting. You're, you're, so one of the things that uh, this piece, I, I'm trying to remember where I read it, it may have been the Financial Times this morning, is Angela Merkel actually has very little direct power on what states do in Germany, but she has been able to persuade them to pretty much operate in lockstep with each other with respect to public health policy. Yes, yes. And, and that's a very big contrast with the United States. Yes, and indeed the European Union, except in financial matter, the financial matter of support, which I guess we'll come onto at some point, um, European Union has been quite successful in that, in, in, in managing the travel restrictions around so, everybody, so that everybody has broadly the same uh, travel restrictions across the Schengen area. That is, is been something where Merkel and Macron have been very instrumental. So her powers of persuasion and brokering and reason and you know all that, all of that, rather than demagoguery, um, are admired across Europe. So I think that does. You're going to segue. You're going to bring me nicely into a segue point. And by the way, for people who have any questions for Colin, please type them into the Q and A box, and I will forward them to Colin. Um, Support uh, from the government. Uh, now here we've had quite a lot of it in the United States too. Uh, very generous unemployment benefits, uh, unemployment benefits going to people who in the past didn't get them. That is independent contractors, um, a loan pro a forgivable loan program for employers who keep their uh, employers uh, employees on payroll. And as a result of this, we're, we're having a sort of divergence right now in the US, and I, I think it's also true in Europe, and you were referring to this between personal income and GDP. So we can be certain that GDP in the second quarter in the US will have fallen considerably just because we're not doing as much stuff as we were before. Um, but at the same time, people are getting cash that's allowing them to pay their rents and so on. Um, all of this at the moment is going to disappear at the end of this month. Um, and it's something that makes me very nervous about the economy in the U.S. unless the Senate comes back and agrees to something with the House and, and we get further um, relief. What, what is the trajectory of this, these sorts of policies in Europe right now? And I'm assuming there's variation across the U.K. and the continent. Yeah, there, there, there is quite a bit of difference. But, but, but broadly, um, in, in most ways, people are the governments are broadly supporting people to uh, to sit on the bench so um that is you know the distinctions between the the, the regimes needn't concern us very much they're almost all as equally generous as 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 each other they all they're all time limited um and uh some require you to register as unemployed as in the us and others um in which case you break the link with the company in other cases um, they uh, they support you in the company, um, as in the UK. And uh, if the, the key thing and the advantage of that is that um, if you plan then at the end to make a lot of people redundant, you've got to go through the consultancy uh, pr consultation process that we have. Um, and it starts about now. And there are, because the, if you're going to make people redundant at the end of the furlough system, which is in October, then you've got to start consulting people now. So we're beginning to see the signs of companies that are going to retain most of their people and companies that are going to lose a large number of their people. Um, in, in the US, that's masked in a way because they're already gone. And it's the question is, are they rehired? 
Um, but but yes, the burden of your your point is correct. You know, the rubber is has not yet hit the road, and it it is about it is kind of beginning to happen now. And this is when we're going to see the shape of how many, for example, restaurants are going to be able to survive on uh, two meter distancing or one meter distancing. How many um, how, how many people are going to want to go to town and shop? How many people are going to want shop locally and those sorts of issues are going to have to work themselves through into the economy but essentially if the business survives then the benefits of full employment of of, of some unemployment will in fact help uh, some companies restructure themselves save themselves some money and uh, then put themselves leaner and fitter for the future and take a set of decisions they might they might have been a bit reluctant to take up for COVID. So in some respects, the companies will probably do better and there will be a, certain, a net loss of wealth in the, in the economy, but some companies will do better and some individuals will do very badly, particularly in the black economy, uh, by which I don't know if that term is, is widely used in the US. What Inform I mean- We call it the informal economy. Okay, well, there we are. It, it's, the same, it, it, it's, it's the same concept. Um, that that economy has been cruelly shown up uh, because you know people who don't have who aren't in the system uh, can't claim on the system, and that's been very difficult. So one of the things that's happening in the U.S. is we're seeing COVID have very disparate impacts, and I think you were referring a little bit to this uh, with respect to the economy in Europe before. But I'm talking about directly in terms of health impacts. When we look at communities of color, uh, they are disproportionately bearing the burden of COVID. And yes. exactly why that is, I mean, one of the things I've decided is I'm sort of keeping my mouth shut about what causes COVID and what doesn't, because every time we think we know something, it proves to be incorrect. I, I, I do think the evidence is pretty convincing that wearing masks is a good idea, and I want to come back to that in a bit. But um, but in, in this country, African-Americans and Latinos are dying at much faster rates from COVID than other groups. Is there a similar sort of dynamic playing out in Europe? Yes, that is a, that is a, a common thought. And the fear about ascribing causes is, um, is shared as well. That there seem to be two um, things that are, are, are reasonably good, reasonably respectable cause or respectably academically supported causal explanations. One is that poverty is disproportionately um, linked to diseases like um, diabetes um, and, and some of the other comorbidities associated with this disease. And poverty is also disproportionately associated with those communities. So, so that's one that seemed, where there seems to be some evidence. The other, which is, is just not so obvious, which is in England in particular, um, the term we use is black, Asian and minority ethnic BAME. Um, the, those people are disproportionately employed in the health service and uh, hospitals are fearsome breeding grounds for this virus. So um, quite a lot of health professionals have, uh, have added, unfortunately, to all the statistics of deaths. Uh, because they have uh, they have been um, involved in the health service. You don't want to go to hospital if you um, fear this particular virus. So again, I'll remind you, if you have questions for Colin, please type them into the Q&A box that you should be seeing on your screen. I see um, two I, I, things on the chat box. I don't know where Oh, the chat okay. I, I am not... Um, Oh, that's just to tell people um, where to enter their questions. Okay. Um, uh, let's turn a little bit to uh, U.S.-European relations. And, and so the world is, be we were globalizing pretty rapidly and pretty ubiquitously. Um, and this has led to a number of phenomena, one of which are very efficient supply chains. I want to come back to that point a little later. Um, but just generally the politics of globalization and relationships between the UK and the US, Europe and the UK, US. Do you see COVID changing that, accelerating it, decelerating it? What, what do you see going forward 
in terms of these relationships and how will this matter to things like capital flows, for example? Okay, um, the, the, I, I'll tell a story about, the, uh, about something called Exercise Signet. Exercise Signet or Cygnus, I can't remember exactly what it was. It was, it was a disaster planning uh, exercise that was done in the UK government to prepare for the major risks and things that could, could show, throw us off course. In 2016, the first of which, number one, top of, top of the pile was a pandemic. They modeled it on a, uh, on a flu pandemic, but nevertheless, it was a pandemic. And they realized that they would need a whole lot of kit. They would need uh, personal protective equipment. They would need testing uh, facilities. They would need all the stuff that we now know we need. Um, and uh, they, the civil servants who were charged with drawing up this disaster plan said, don't worry, minister. Um, we've got it all sorted out. We've got our supply chains all set up. Uh, France, um, China, um, and uh, everybody said, oh, well, that's all right then. No problem. We'll soon be able to get the kit. We don't need to stockpile it. No issue. When this one came around, the French decided that they were going to keep all their personal protective equipment for the needs of France. And um, it wasn't so easy as people thought to get stuff out of China uh, because there were other considerations that work there because the, everybody wanted to get their stuff out of China and the Chinese were making the most of it. It's hard for me as a capitalist to criticize them for that. Um, and so the nature of globalization, um, it doesn't really work in, a, in an emergency. In an emergency where there's massive international competition for resources, you, you can't necessarily rely on the supply chains that work in peacetime. And I think people are going to start saying, what is important for what is strategically important and the germans will for example say it is strategically important to have a uh, a very well developed testing system for diseases and they uh, had one it was domestic and they used it um, there might be some who might say we should have a stockpile of this um, equipment uh, that we needed switzerland did have a stockpile of its equipment um, and uh, uh, France did not, nor did Britain. So, um, so people might start to say some things are strategically important. And that is playing itself out um, with Huawei, um, where suddenly the British who were okay with Huawei are now not okay with Huawei because they're beginning to say, not just because of Hong Kong, but because of issues with supplies and with the China, thinking about the Chinese state, that maybe you don't want to put yourself in the hands of a foreign power. And um, I think America has chosen to uh, restrict the production of a certain vaccine, or, or is it remdesivir, a, a treatment, rem, remdesivir, to, to the people who the producer produces it for, they want it to go to America first. You can understand that, uh, but it's kind of new in the context of globalization. So I think that the people are going to think about that stuff a lot more. We're going to see things about strategic reserves and how important it is to be food sufficient and oil sufficient. And those sorts of considerations are going to come into political, uh, political life. And they've been kind of forgotten about a bit. Uh, they were there after the Second World War and they've gone away and now they're going to come back, in my view. Well, I, I, you know, you're, you're reminding me of how a visit to Japan was really important to me in terms of understanding Japanese policy with respect to rice. Because when you go, this is at the time, the first time I went there was when property values in Japan were such that the Imperial Palace was worth more than the entire state of California. Yeah, I remember. And you come in from the airport and there are all these rice paddies and you think this is crazy. Why are they wasting this land cultivating rice? You could use it for much more productive purposes. And then you talk to Japanese people and they say, well, you know, we starved, nearly starved to death after World War II because we didn't have our own rice. Mm. And so for us, it's worth giving up some prosperity. And they knew, I mean, they, they were very explicit about the trade-off. It wasn't some nonsense article uh, argument about how it was important, you know, for Japanese values to have farmers or anything like that. It was being without rice scares us. And so we don't care that it's costing us money. We're going to have enough rice on our own to sustain ourselves if we ever need to. Uh -huh. And that, that, that conversation stuck with me ever since. And now I think the world is thinking more 
like that. But it's a very, to your point, very kind of anti-capitalist argument because it asserts that you need some inefficiencies in your oh, yeah. economy yes. in order to have security and things that you really matter. Well, and, look, I, I mean, we spend all this money on defense. I mean, that is the, 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 the most obvious example of something where you throw all capital throw money away, basically, yeah. Get your care out of the window and, and throw, you know, throw bombs at people and blow up the money, um, you know, or hold them in reserve for that. Now, we all need it. We all need it. But how much? Yeah. Isn't it defense against pandemics, defense against rockets, which is the more important, you might ask. So, well, the other thing is, I, I'm curious if you're thinking about the supply chain. Um, the other element is, I mean, you identified strategic things like uh, medicine yeah. or like PPE equipment. That was just redundant. It's either PPE or personal protective. Anyway. Um, but the other thing that was really striking to me is if you look at U.S. manufacturing, a very large share of it, and I don't remember the exact percentage right now, it's something like 40%, has somewhere along the uh, manufacturing process one Chinese, at least one Chinese part. Mm -hmm. And if you think about it, if that part is only available in China, it doesn't matter that you have all the other parts. You still can't build the thing that you want to build without that particular yeah. Chinese yeah. part. So when you look at Chinese content as a share of American manufacturing, it's actually still pretty small. This is distinct from Chinese yes. goods that get imported into the United States. You look at something that's called made in America, that it typically still has pretty overwhelmingly North American content in it. Mm -hmm. like all you need is that one screw. Yeah. It's a special screw from China. Um, and if you can't get it anymore, suddenly your process is screwed up. And so I wonder if that's going to lead to beyond the strategic sorts of things, at least trying to create redundancies in, yes. in the supply chain. And is business equipped to do this, given that their motivation, properly so, is bottom line, which means cost reduction. Redundancy by its very nature means you're adding cost to the process. Yeah, although there's another factor at work, which is, well, two, uh, which is the whole social responsibility agenda. This is, um, you know, climate change, all that stuff that involves deferring current enjoyment for future uh, sustainability, for future security, for future, uh, the, the long term word in the injunction in business school to uh, look after the long term interests of the shareholders. So it's business survivability, business survival is, is always part of the chief executive's objective set. And, and survival means, uh, means dealing with the supply chain issue and dealing with securities, security of supply. And if you need to stockpile screws, stockpile screws. But, you know, and if you need to, for example, be a bit jumpy about certain business partners in certain parts of the world, well, you may have to do that. But I think there's going to, we're going to see a lot of that. There's going to be limitations to, there's limitate, there, there will be, increased arguments for the power of the state and there will be increased arguments for the security of business and um and long-term sustainability of business and those two factors will be medium-term trends that will come out of this much more than being caring for our neighbors i think so i i i'm going to move on to questions from the audience in a minute but i want i want to reserve one more for myself so as we think okay. about coming out of this um governments have borrowed a lot in order to get us through this and for whatever it's worth, I think that's the right thing to do. But once we get past it, um, presumably governments are going to want to start paying this money that it's borrowed, they've borrowed back. Um, how do you see that happening? What sort of changes in tax policy might you see or might we not see or spending policy, et cetera? So do you have any thoughts on the long term fiscal implications of all of this. Yeah, I, I mean, the governments have been very ready to step up to the plate and put money, onto the, uh, put money into this, this problem. And um, they seem to have um, been pretty cavalier about, uh, about what the consequences of that might be. I don't think we're gonna see much inflation anytime soon. I'm not an economist, but I'd, somehow all the pressures seem to me to push the other way. 
that doesn't seem to be the risk. The risk, and, 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 I, and I think after a decade of quantitative easing, which has been broadly successful, depending how you look at it, um, I, I don't think people are going to be in a big rush to tighten the fiscal screw um, just at the time when many businesses and areas of the economy are fragile. So I suspect that the temptation to punt all this into the long, into the medium term future, particularly when interest rates are as low as they are, that that temptation will be very strong. And uh, I think we're, we're about to see a financial statement tomorrow. Uh, we've uh, in England, we've there was one in a way from uh, from Boris Johnson last week, promising all kinds of construction. You know, this is almost Trumpian in its generosity. Um, and, uh, and, you know, that seems to be the way governments are seeing it. There is one rather egregious exception, however, uh, which is the European Union, um, where the European Union has failed to agree amidst the richer countries that they should support the, um, the poorer countries of the South. So France and Germany have been sponsoring a program to try and uh, make $750 million worth of credits, euros, avail uh, available to um, Italy, Spain, Portugal, and so on. And the uh, fiscal, fiscally prudent um, are saying, no, actually, we don't see why we should uh, pay money to support other countries. We've got enough bills of our own to pick up. So maybe that's a signal that there are limits to the amount of uh, fiscal space everybody thinks they've got. But for the moment, they seem to be spending at quite eye-watering uh, quite eye-watering levels. And I don't think they're too concerned about what the consequences are, nor it seems other central banks. So from the audience, from uh, Harish Chatlani, um, and I don't know if you want to take this one or not, but how do you see real estate prices in both the residential and commercial sector in Europe, but mainly in London? In London, well, in, in London, I can speak more to the residential than the commercial, but I, of course, have an opinion about it. The uh, residential has come to a complete, uh, pretty much complete halt. There are some exceptional properties that are moving, but uh, relatively few. Um, and uh, it will be a while before it's clear what, what's, what the direction of travel is, is going to be. We were in a downturn anyway. Um, there may be some people who are forced to sell by economic circumstances, but possibly not in the centre of London. Most people who own property in the centre of London are unlikely to be forced sellers, and the pressure on the banks to force them out will be will be uh, uh, on the bank not to force them out will be there. So I suspect that there won't be too much price disclosure of that kind. Um, my phone has decided to ring. If you can hear it, I'm sorry. It's, it's fine. I will, um, it was somebody calling. There we are. Um, uh, and so in, the, in the case of commercial real estate, I think there's a, there's a real worry about um, the people be, being stuck with classes of real estate. It's the same problem as in the US with the malls. Uh, classes of real estate that, that are no longer uh, really viable. And there's been a fight for some while between the retailers um, who are in too many places um, wanting to get out of the leases that they've signed. And they're treating this as an opportunity to do so. So I suspect that the, um, that the revenue side of a number of property companies, operate, commercial property companies operating in the UK will uh, be under some pressure. Uh, also, as I mentioned before, office uh, space in central cities particularly london will be um will be under some pressure because there will be quite a lot of people who are going to say well we only need half the number of seats in those offices now because the rest of the people are working from home they only need to be here two or three days a week so there will be some pressure of that kind we'll wait to see how significant it is um from james torres what are the keys going forward for both european and american real estate professionals to facilitate more real estate transactions up the the atlantic are there companies or technologies that are bright lights in this intercontinental real estate challenge i'm not sure i understood the question you read it a bit uh, a bit quickly you know are there any particular trends that are going to emerge te technologically that are going to change I, the, you know, the I, landscape I, for real estate 
Yeah, I, and also, do will these technologies basically um, allow Americans to participate more in Europe and vice versa in real estate markets? I think that's the thrust of the question. I, I, I frankly don't know. Um, I, 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 I'm not quite sure what technologies are uh, are likely to have emerged from the present situation that weren't there before. Um, the, um, maybe the question I could clarify in some way. I, um, yeah, so it's James, do you want to um, try that again? Because this sort of technology that we're using here, it's been, been there for a while, we just all learned how to use it. Um, so what, one thing I found um, really interesting was your remark at the opening about Venice and yeah. how people are not wearing masks. Only in shops. Yeah. Only in shops. Uh, is there any sign of a recurrence or things? No, seem to be... no, there isn't. Um, and uh, there, there was there have been a, occasional. There's been small outbreaks in uh, Germany, and I think there was one in northern Italy, um, but very small and very localized and very easily contained. Uh, they just there's some factory. A lot of people get it because they're all in the you know because their working practice is there, and the government jumps all over it locks it all up, puts all the people away for two weeks and out they come healthy. You know, and they know the, the treatments are stronger and better than they have been in the past. And so they, a few of these people die. And so the death rate, which is the sort of hallmark, the gold standard that runs through all of this, the very small changes following the major unlocking um, that's taken place. Um, and that is, is a good sign uh, for the future. People say, well, that's because it's the summer and the virus doesn't prosper in the summer. Well, maybe, but it's... Um, well, it's summer here and the virus is raging here. Yes, and it's summer in Brazil and there's quite a few cases there and it's summer in India. There's quite a few cases there. What they, uh, what, um, although um, you might think that, uh, that India would, because everybody lives very close together, you would think that India would have very large rates of infection. Not so. Um, and similarly, uh, Brazil has um, a, a relatively stable uh, situation now. There's lots of people getting it every day, lots of people dying every day, but it's not getting any bigger. Um, so, uh, you know, I, I don't think the heat is the issue. I think the, heat, the issue is um, there's, there's another factor at work and it's not easy to see what it is. So, uh, okay, we have... Okay, this is, so this is, so James is saying because the pandemic has halted travel. Yeah. Um, how can basically Americans and Europeans do business with each other, transactions in a world where, and as you know, Americans are not permitted to go to Europe? Yes, uh, and nor are Europeans permitted to go to America, as far as I know. Um, uh, the, uh, well, I, I think, you know, we're doing it now. Um, and I think that it's, uh, perfectly, it's always been perfectly possible to do business um, in this way. Um, I have contracted for real estate on the phone with a with a video tour, with with measurement, with all kinds. Of, we've all seen propositions of this kind transmitted from other countries for years. Some of the cultural things, some of the subtleties are, are harder to get at, but nonetheless, I mean, broadly, you know, it's all doable if you're prepared to. So, uh, to put up with a certain amount of, of, of um, uncertainty, you build that into your equation and it's still all doable. Uh, I think we may get back to the point where we have trusted agents in different parts of the world who are there all the time and we, uh, and we perhaps um, sit at home more and work through other people. Uh, that may be a, a trend, and, but I don't think the total amount of, 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 of capital flows will diminish. Um, if there's if people have got money to invest, um, there's normally plenty of people offering assistance as to how to get it placed, um, and uh, there's the, the, it shouldn't really be too difficult to continue that process. I don't think we're going to see the a grinding of the wheels of capitalism. In other words, I think that's going to be that's that that's going to function just fine. Um, the, 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 over time, some relationships may be more difficult to sustain because people won't see one another that much. But I mean, you can, you can get a pretty good idea of the people you're dealing with on the phone and 
like this. So maybe we'll just get a bit more used to it. Well, um, Colin Barrow, always a delight to talk with you. Uh, thank you very much for your insights this morning. And again, Colin, thank you very much for joining us today. It's been my pleasure. Thanks very much. Okay. Take care, everybody. Stay safe.